there just happens to be a techno fetishism that happens when technology is doing impressive things that it becomes the new god and i think we have to be very cautious about that i can't open a wine bottle i can't parallel park <laughs> i don't know my left and right yeah. I, I i can't cook i'm actually a kind of bundle of failures that have led me to actually do this one thing <laughs> This is Brain Inspired. Hello, current and future thought leaders. I am Paul Middlebrooks. Thanks for joining me here. Today, my guest is John Krakauer, who, despite what you just heard him say, is talented at many things, including making your world better today by spending so much time talking with me. He is a neuroscientist and a neurologist at Johns Hopkins University, uh, but we get to all of that in just a minute. I actually lucked out and got to have a beer with John in Madrid, New Mexico, of all places, over the holidays recently. He happened to be near Santa Fe visiting his brother David, who is president of the Santa Fe Institute, where they study the science of complexity. And I happened to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And one blizzardy night, I snuck away from my family and joined him at the Mine Shaft, the only restaurant slash bar open in Madrid. I was repeatedly warned not to drink the water, uh, as if it were old Mexico there. And so we happily drank the beer instead. Obviously, we didn't uh, record the podcast that evening, uh, but a few weeks later. This is a long episode uh, because John was generous with his time, uh, and it is in keeping with his outlook that science should proceed carefully and thoughtfully. I think this is going to be a real treat for you. We talk about John's perspective paper from last year that pushes the idea that we need to focus more on behavior to understand what our brains are actually doing. Uh, That is a very simplified summary, and you'll hear John flesh out his and his co-authors' thoughts uh, on this a lot more. Uh, But we go way beyond science here, too, and talk about broader topics like philosophy, what it even means to understand something. And John offers tons of useful nuggets that I know you'll appreciate and continue to think about uh, moving forward. I love the direction that this episode takes, and I want to try more episodes like this in the future. There are a ton of show notes in this one, uh, lots of links to the millions of books <laughs> that that John mentions. So be sure to check out the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 25. If you like this show, please consider supporting it on Patreon. Go to the homepage, braininspired.co, and find the red Patreon button there. And you can contribute 2 or $4 per month, a teensy tiny amount. Thanks this week to Daniel, Sebastian, and Sean Thank you, guys, and thanks to my other supporters. It makes me eager to keep bringing you excellent people like this guy. John Krakauer, welcome to the show, and thanks for joining me. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. So I will have introduced you a bit more um, before we're talking here, but you are a neurologist and a neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins University where, among other many things, you run the BLAM Lab, the Brain, Learning, Animation, and Movement Lab. And you work on all sorts of movement-related research, like motor control, motor learning. Um, In your neurology work, you you work on recovery after stroke. You produce interactive video games of dolphins that people can (laughs) control, bringing them back to their childhood so that they can help repair their brain regions after a stroke. That might be interesting to talk about if we have time for it. You've recently published a book called Broken Movement, The Neurobiology of Motor Recovery After Stroke, uh, uh, which is in MIT Press. But lately, you've been exercising your philosophical bent as well. Uh, And I know that you have a new book coming up. And just before we spoke, you said today you're working on that book a little bit. Can can you just tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So um, last February... um, in 2017, a paper came out that I wrote with colleagues um, about a, a, a sort of a mildly philosophical paper on the role of behavior 
um, an understanding in neuroscience, which led to a what? lot of interest and and some people read it and thought it could be made into a book. Uh-huh. Um, I wasn't really interested in sort of just revisiting that topic, um, but then with my good friend and co-author Asif Gazanfa, who's a professor of neuroscience at Princeton, he and I had always been interested in writing a book, or we were interested in books in general. He's reviewed books for TLS and other places. Um, so we thought, why not? We could actually uh, do what we've always wanted to do, which is work together, write a book, and here we are being asked to do so. And so we said yes. And, you know, it's still in its early stages. Uh, the working title right now is What is Neuroscience Thinking? Hmm. And we are still trying to work out its exact structure and what the core arguments will be. But it's beginning to crystallize. Well, that's, uh, that's good because um, we're going to talk a lot about that paper, that that perspective that you wrote with uh, David. Is it Popple or Popel? Popel. David Popel. Popel, yeah. He, he was one of the five authors. That's right. Yeah, multiple other authors. So uh, people will have uh, a seed to think about. So when the book comes out, they'll get to go and buy the book and, and this will be a good introduction, hopefully, for, for that. Yes, yes. So can can we talk just a few minutes about just the act of writing? Because, you know, a lot of academics write books and a lot of academics are really busy. And can we talk just about writing in general, the process and juggling, with, you know, how to, how to juggle it with your ag- academic work and so on? Right. So I think there are a number of issues here. I think, first of all, writing books is not the norm, as you know, <laughs> as an academic unit in the sciences. In other words, papers are. So yes, scientists can write popular science books, and we can get to that in a minute, but in general, unlike in the humanities, where you basically make or break your career based on the books you've written, that's not true in the sciences. Now, writing can apply to anything. You can write an abstract for Society for Neuroscience. You, mm-hmm. you, you can write a paper. But I think writing is long-form thought. And I think long-form thought, the essay, the review article, the book, um, isn't something that you get trained to do very well in scientific training. And along with a good friend of mine, um, he's an astrophysicist uh, at Hopkins, Briss Menard, you know, we've talked about how books are sort of multi-scale objects, right? You have the word, the sentence, the paragraph, the page, the chapter, the whole book. Mm. And so it has multiple scales, and therefore you have to think on multiple scales. So I would say that essays and books change the way you think. They, they transform your subject in the act of having to write, is my view. I certainly found that to be the case when I wrote the stroke book, that I rediscovered the subject and had a different feel for it in the very act of writing the book and having to synthesize all that information. And in fact, I have friends in the stroke recovery field who said that they noticed a change in the way that I presented the material at meetings. Uh uh, that they attributed to what happened to me when I uh, wrote the book. Um, so that's one thing. But as to your other question, can you find the time to write them? Very difficult, <laughs> right? In other words, uh, <laughs> you have to have a kind of setup, whether it's your chair, whether you've managed to do it for yourself, to write. Uh, I know people who have written. I remember uh, Jack Martin, a neuroscientist in New York, who wrote a neuroanatomy textbook. And he would get up at four in the morning every day to write it. Um, I had two inspirations uh, at Hopkins. There's a very famous neuro ophthalmologist called David Z, who, along with his friend John Lee, yeah. wrote the definitive textbook on the neurology of eye movement, which is now in its fifth edition and is a classic. Yep. Uh, and so he, that was a big, big inspiration. And then Reza Shadmir, who's a professor of neuroscience at Hopkins, has also written a couple of books on motor control that it was also an inspiration. But these are not the norm, but I consider both of them intellectuals, and I think that we need a little bit more intellectualism to come back, especially into neuroscience. And one way that maybe it would happen automatically is if people got back to long-form thinking. Both those points, I, I have something to say. So time-wise, uh, I've been reading this book called, I think it's called Daily Rituals. I'll have to look it up to make sure. But uh, it's just an account of a bunch of different 
authors, famous writers, artists, uh, uh, musicians, and sort of how they spent their day, you know, like when they worked and w- what they did. And it's really frustrating because so many of them uh, were otherwise unemployed or were benefactors of someone else's money uh, mm-hmm. and, and just, you know, they'd, they'd wake up and smoke in bed for three hours uh, and then, you know, without anyone speaking to them, and then they'd go on a five-hour walk and then they'd mm-hmm. go to a, a pub and then they'd come back and think for another hour, you know. So it's like they have all of this time and academics don't have that time. So you really have to be disciplined. Uh, yes. I mean, what I find is that in order for me to write, I need to have the whole day free and then find the hour that will jump on me and go, this is the hour. Um, for example, last night I finished ed- writing a paper, which I just couldn't muster the willpower to write. And then suddenly I had the desire to write it at around 11 o'clock at night and it just came out of my fingers. And, you know, there's so many examples of what you're saying. I mean, Immanuel Kant never left Konigsberg and people could set their clocks by the walk that he would take uh, around the city. Darwin, who wrote 20 odd books, you know, basically because of wealth and Chagas disease, uh, lived in the countryside and an incredible wife and wrote and wrote and wrote. So yes, writing and Doing things slowly and deeply is out of fashion. There's no time for it. Well, there's <laughs> no time because we've scheduled and PowerPointed our way out of <laughs> our own thinking, right? Yeah. In other words, it's, uh, you know, when you Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, it's now it should really be called Thinking Fast and Faster. You know? <laughs> nice. Well, the other thing that you said is that the act of writing actually helped you um, think through things and revisit them in a new light. And a lot of famous authors uh, have suggested that as well, in fiction and nonfiction, that you really don't know that writing is an act of thinking and hashing out the way that you think about a subject. So I think that's just interesting that you say that. I, I agree that it's a super valuable and frustrating endeavor. Yes, yes. And, and of course, all writers are readers. So in other words, not only do you have to find the time to to write yourself, but in preparation and in parallel, you have to read a lot yourself. And I I mean, I just don't know how many people find the time to regularly imbibe large chunks of book, you know? Yeah, right. And variety, not just... Yes, yes. And, you know, and, and again, that final point on that is creative scientists, I mean, you know, Dean Simington has looked at this, tend to be very interested in the arts and they're not just writing uh reading science books they're 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 reading novels they're they're reading history they're reading philosophy i mean einstein was a big reader niels bohr was a big reader Mm. um so it's 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 a lot of time (laughs) yeah time (laughs) time well spent Uh, is, uh, is there any part of you that wishes that you had chosen to be uh, an author, or, you know, strictly, and gone more down that road than the science road. I know it's really rewarding what you do. Um, no, I, I don't think so. In so much that what you write about is about what you've done. But I must admit, there's a part of me thinking down the line that I might be more interested in the history and philosophy of science. You know, HPS. Um, yeah, and it, it it does interest me, and we we'll, we can talk maybe a little bit more about philosophy and history and and how important they are to science, you know, later if you want. And yeah. I know you want to bring that up, but yes, it it has occurred to me. Well, it's interesting reading just reading um, your perspective that we're going to get to in a few minutes here, and and then going down the rabbit hole and reading some of the references with the that are historically philosophical, you know, the philosophy of science and history of science oriented, uh, it's it's really opened up sort of that philosophical way of thinking to me again that I had I kind of lost but in my specialization in graduate school and as, you know, doing a postdoc. I started off interested in philosophy, and that's really what got me into neuroscience. And then you get really specialized in in uh, and it sort of it can really take you out of the, the philosophical way of thinking. So, but yeah, so we'll we'll get to that. Yeah, I mean, because you've actually said the um, the key notions. In other words, people have written about this specialization and philosophical contemplation are, in fact, 
in conflict with each other. And um, that, that is one of the key reasons to make a case for philosophy is that it's a counterbalance to forced specialization. But, you know, we can talk about that. Yeah. Well, okay. So you, your brother is uh, David Krakauer, and he's the president of the Santa Fe Institute, where they study complexity science. Mm -hmm. And a few episodes ago, I interviewed Melanie Mitchell, who's an external yes. faculty. And, you know, hopefully I'll get to interview your brother sometime soon. And you guys actually uh, co-authored, <laughs> I guess you'd say, this nice paper in Current Biology. Um, and by the way, I, I just got my most recent manuscript just got rejected from Nature uh, immediately, so now it's it's in review at Current Biology. Nice little well, nice little journal. <laughs> so I, I, th I, th it's, I think it's my favorite journal actually. Because, oh, cool! Uh, because it's so ecumenical with respect to creatures, it loves all the animals. That's really true. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I hear da uh, David's a terrible brother, and I'm sorry to hear it. <laughs> yes. So you guys, you guys seem pretty close. Uh, yeah. not, not all brothers are. So, is there any um, any competitive streak between you? Um, I think we went from indifference towards each other <laughs> to towards complete sort of friendship and overlap without really much competition in between, I would say. What age um, was that? What age did that happen? I think, I think I can tell you, I think, you know, I was always the good student in school and he was always <laughs> slightly, um, sort of less interested you know, the older, younger brother syndrome. And then I think what happened is that when I, when we sort of stopped, you know, I went to Cambridge and then he a few years later went to University of London and then I moved to the United States and he began to develop his own interests in computer science and evolutionary biology. I think in my absence, he overtook me basically. And, um, <laughs> yeah. On. And then, and then he, and then he, finally moved back to the United States. He went to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and then from there he went to the Santa Fe Institute, where he basically has stayed ever since, except for a short sojourn at, at, at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and I think throughout that time, we, we kept talking about books in general and about science. And I think in a way, he was the one that made me realize I wanted to be more of a full-time scientist than a physician. I think he was the one, through our conversations, said, John, you started in science, then you went into medicine, and then you went back into research, and I think that's where you belong because you keep asking these kind of questions. And we were just talking the other day, and it's come all the way to the point where he says, John, basically you're a complexity scientist. <laughs> oh, okay. And, okay. and he actually reminds me of a letter where he wrote to me saying that there were abstract ways of thinking about science that moved above the particular specialty or medium, and I apparently disagreed with him back then. But now I'm in full agreement. So I think we're just now fellow book readers and fellow complexity scientists. It's just that he knows more about complexity than I do. <laughs> I was going to ask you how much complexity science really has shaped and continues to shape the way that you think and approach your work. So I, w I will talk about that, too. I, I would say increasingly so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because so, yeah, I, I talked to David um, oh yesterday and he said he's perpetually disappointed with you. I just thought I'd let you know. So. <laughs> Did, did you really talk with him? No, of course not. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to rile you guys up, though. Maybe I can get you guys in a heated uh, <laughs> competition. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this paper. So this this perspective that you wrote with David Popple and a bunch of other co-authors as well called Neuroscience Needs Behavior, Correcting a Reductionist Bias. So, John, you son of a bitch. <laughs> why, <laughs> why do you hate neurons and technology so much? Yeah, um, well, I don't. To be first of all, I'm not going to fall into that trap. Uh, I'm not a Luddite. I mean, uh, as you know, we've developed video games, we have robotics, we do brain stimulation, functional imaging. So I'm, I'm far from somebody who sort of shuns technology, although I do believe that you can do deep things with simple behavioral experiments. In other words, I think amongst my friends, uh, who do psychophysics, I think it never ceases to amaze us that you can actually make quite deep discoveries with fairly simple experiments. Yeah. Um, so, and sometimes I've had people say to me, you know, why are you doing it? It, lo it looks so sort of 
late 19th century, early 20th century. <laughs> you know, um, but I do think that you can still uh, do interesting experiments without having to have vast outlays in, in technology. Um, but anyway, I think that the question is sort of a deep one. I mean, I, I do believe that that we are entering an era where sort of the industrialization of science, as some have called it, is happening, where the combination of technology and big data seem to be the new model for how to do science. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's getting in the way of good old hypothesis-based conceptual science. And um, what you see, for example, with the you know, the brain project at the NIH is that they literally kind of say that the thinking can come later. We'll let the theorists get their hands on the data, but let's just collect as much of it as we can. Mm -hmm. And all I think is going to happen is you're just going to have this mismatch between facts without the ability to turn them into knowledge because of a theoretical gap. And that is basically, I mean, that's why the paper was sort of got, had the bias word in it. It's not that one is sort of trying to simply substitute one thing for another monolithic thing. It's just, there just happens to be a techno fetishism that happens when technology is doing impressive things that it becomes the new God. And I think we have to be very cautious about that. But we'll get deeper into the entirety of the article here, but there is quite a reaction to it. So it's been covered in a lot of places. Like, you know, it's been written about in things like Scientific American, in The Atlantic, um, a bunch of other places. But I know, and, and those were mostly positive, um, supportive reactions. And I know that you've had backlash as well. So what, what reactions have you had from this paper and, and, and maybe even continue to have? Yeah, I mean, I have to admit, you know, I, what this paper took about two and a half years to write. It has an interesting history of its own. It all started with the Gordon Conference, where some editors at a journal sort of suggested that I write something based on the style of a talk that I gave. And then at that meeting, David Popple, who I had not known before then, sort of whisked me off in his convertible to have a coffee, saying <laughs> I thought I was wonderful, <laughs> and we have to be friends forever, BFFs, and... Um, and this was the sort of the beginnings of this paper. And we wrote it, and many people read it along the way. Um, and then the week that it came out, I remember, it was February the 8th, 2017, was the week that I had to get my manuscript into MIT Press for the Broken Movement book. Otherwise, it would not be out in time for um, SFM. So I, my mind was elsewhere. And then suddenly, my Twitter feed, my email my facebook jammed <laughs> jammed and yeah it was just like it was what was going on you know it was a little bit like what happened when the new yorker profiled me a, a few years before you know it was just um lots and lots of traffic and that traffic continued um and continued and and i had no i had not thought that it would generate this degree of interest i really didn't so all i can say is i think it came at the right time. It was latent in the zeitgeist. Many people, especially the young, I think grad students and postdocs, did feel they were selling a little bit of a, being sold a bill of goods by their neuroscience departments. So, you know, just get a technique, pick an animal model, and just generate data, right? And jump on the conveyor belt and keep your head down and don't think too much. And so I got a lot of very positive responses from the young. Right, saying, you know, thank God you kind of called that the emperor has no clothes, uh, that you're going against the orthodoxy. So lots of that. Uh, and then from many psychologists, cognitive neuroscientists, very positive response. <laughs> yeah. um, some of the hardcore neuroscientists were not unpleasant, but, you know, Tony Zeta sort of had a whole... Twitter stream about it. Um, and then it basically boiled down to saying, you know, it's all a matter of taste and that some people are more interested in mechanism than others, with the word mechanism being synonymous with you've got to be touching, licking, kissing a neuron. And of course, which was exactly what we were refuting in, in that paper. Mm -hmm. So I would say that my contemporaries in 
more reductionist neuroscience were less than pleased, but I never got, I didn't get attacked. They probably just in their silence or just cursed amongst <laughs> themselves. Um, but in, but in terms of what I actually received, yeah. it was very positive. Yeah. Good. Uh, there were, yeah, overall. And th there was one, um, oh, I'm trying to forget, remember his name. He's a scientist at the University of Nottingham in England, and he has a very good blog. Um, and I really like him, actually. Um, I haven't met him. But he wrote a slightly, oh, we've heard all this before. This, this gets recycled periodically and was, I think, a little dismissive. That, so that was published. Um, the, the Spike, I think it's called. The blog. Oh, uh, Mark Humphreys? Mark Humphreys. Yeah, he's, he's been on the podcast, a delightful fellow. Yeah, Mark. So he wrote something slightly. And, you know, I've always wanted the opportunity to sort of discuss it with him. But his was a little bit smarmy, I thought. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I actually thought about him when I was just this morning when I was reading um, some, of, some of your work. And uh, so that's interesting. Um, I, I didn't yes. realize that he had written that piece. But. Yes, he had. Yeah. Mm hmm. Lately, something I've really appreciated interviewing the past couple months is I, I just I think it's wonderful how texts that are 50, 60, 70 years old are being revisited in light of our modern knowledge and technological abilities. And it's like I can't help but wonder if this is a like a law of scientific progress that we always cycle back to this kind of older work. So I I interviewed Matt Botvinnik and he bases uh, a lot of his work on experiments done by Harry Harlow in like 1949 mm -hmm. in the 40s. Mm -hmm. I just interviewed Tim Behrens, who, you know, he harkens back to Edward Tolman with the concept of cognitive maps. Mm -hmm. uh, and then here I'm talking with you. And in your paper, uh, you guys reference Nicholas Tenbergen's work in the yeah. 50s and 60s, his work on behavior and ethology and, uh, and his four questions needed to explain phenomena. It'd be neat to work out you know, like the rate and the uh, the distribution of how far back we look, you know, as we move forward, you know, maybe there's some sort of power law to describe this relationship. Uh, so I'm wondering, it made me think just in a a day-to-day -day basis, how much we've progressed in terms of approaching how we conceive of intelligence and cognition and our own cognitive abilities. Like when a scientist sits down and thinks about human cognition these days, you know, how much does it differ from an analog of that same scientist maybe 100,000 years ago, let's say, um, not in terms of the knowledge that, that we've gained about the brain, but in terms of how we feel about what intelligence is, what we think intelligence and cognition and consciousness is? Do you think that's changed much? Does that even make sense? Well, no, it does make sense. I mean, you know, my brother's very interested in this more general notion of intelligence. And, you know, Matt Botvinnik, you know, uh, feels, I think, um, that what they're trying to do at DeepMind is, is, is to understand intelligence. And so they are willing to both think about it in a superhuman way and also, of course, as humans being the best example of it, learn from humans. But they're sort of agnostic about whether humans in their biological form are the only manifestation of intelligence or will always be. So I think intelligence is superordinate over humans in one way. Mm -hmm. Um, on the other hand, because humans are our best example of it, it's what we mean when we say cognition. In other words, cognitive neuroscience and psychology are really human sciences, right? I think our folk psychological notions will probably not change. I think it'd be very arrogant to presume that we understand how humans think better than Shakespeare did, right, or, right. you know, or, or, or even the Greeks did, or the, Jane Austen didn't understand human psychology as well as we did. I think, of course she did. Right. So yeah. from the standpoint of the material that we need to explain scientifically, I don't think the material has changed very much. Yeah, right? that, you, you, yeah you said folk psychology. That was the, the term that I was missing in that. So that's exactly what I was talking about. And then, of course, the, the, the question is, has folk psychology carved the cognitive space in a way that makes it worthwhile trying to go after its components or should we not trust it because it's basically the psychological version of phrenology the right. division belong right yeah. um so so then you get to sort of psychology and cognitive neuroscience where the idea is that the component processes 
are more validated and that those are the pieces that we then have to get reductionist on. But overall, I think cognition, emotions and planning and thinking and we all have a sort of folk psychological feel about what those things are. And I don't think it's changed that much. All right. Well, everyone is salivating at the thought these days of ever more precise and sophisticated data being recorded. So the quality mm -hmm. of the data and ever more reams of data being recorded. So the quantity of the data that we can record, just as you were describing a few minutes ago, uh, and the ability to perform these causal manipulations to generate causal type explanations uh, for our behaviors. But the contention of this paper that we're talking about is that data is worthless without understanding the behaviors themselves front. So why is behavior important? Yeah, so there, it's interesting that the reception of this paper, some people thought the paper's main idea was that you need more naturalistic behaviors, that you have to go and see these animals in the wild hmm. um, or do your best to get them in the wild. Because otherwise, you know, you're going to be trying to eke out a non-ecological behavior from them. And it's just not, it's like using an iPhone as a hammer. You can do so, but that's not what it evolved to do. Well, I've done it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that was one argument that we had, but the real argument that we made was that the best way to sort of have algorithmic and computational level theories about what might be going on is to go at it through behavior. In other words, it was the way to get your componential pieces to do theorizing with, right? So uh, it was much more that, oh, you know, if I want to have, a, you know, like, for example, reinforcement learning as an entire conceptual apparatus mm -hmm. uh, came from animal behavior, right? I mean, people don't realize that, you know, temporal difference learning and, you know, these computational approaches that are now used all the time at places like DeepMind started from animal behavior work, mm -hmm. all right? So... That was the main point we're trying to make is that if you do good behavioral analysis, you are, it's going to be theory generating, right? And then what you do is start looking at the implementational level of these algorithmic computational ideas you have. Um, but the, but very much the idea was that you do that first. It's very difficult to sort of reverse engineer or bottom up derive such ideas. I'm very, skeptical that something like temporal difference learning would have been derived by recording from the basal ganglia, right? It was an idea that was already in, in existence and it was used to interpret right. the famous work by Wolfram Schultz, right? It was because we knew about this theoretical framework that one could look at those data and go, oh, that looks like a reward prediction error, right? So that was the main deep thrust, which is that most of the time, the theoretical conceptual frameworks with which you then do neuroscience on come from the behavioral side, for the most part. <laughs> okay, nice, for the most part. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, this might be a good time to bring in uh, David Marr's levels of analysis, um, just to frame what we're going to talk about, because... I, you have a, a figure in the paper, it's figure four, for those of you yes. following along at home. Uh, and it's uh, essentially shows where we are now with regard to our scientific progress in this arena and where we want to be. Do you think we should recap David Marr's levels of explanation and, uh, and frame it that way? Or, or do you think we should proceed a different way? Well, I mean, I think that I can imagine certain people listening and sort of rolling their eyes, you know, here comes... Ma all over <laughs> again. Um, yeah, I, I I do think there are many ways that Ma has been understood and misunderstood. I think that Ma very much came from the computational side. Well, that's not true. He came from the lower mechanistic side and then realized the error. Right, no, right, right. I'm saying that with his sort of equilibrium state, you know, w w you know, the Ma we know, right? So I. 
I think, you know, it was basically the idea, like in that diagram, that, you know, you have, you know, the sort of the idea of flight, right, which is quite abstract, and it can apply to bats, and it can apply to birds, and it can apply to planes, it can apply to flying squirrels, right? And that's sort of the more computational idea of flying. And then there's sort of how do you do it? And, you know, well, if you have wings, you flap them. And then you can end up looking down at the level of, well, what, how do you build a wing? How does it be, how is it a, an object that can be flapped? Therefore, you solve the problem of flying. Right. And he had a famous line where he sort of saying, you know, studying neurons to understand cognition or something like that is as useful as studying feathers to understand flight, you know. And, you know, this has been, I, I think, on your podcast, Matt Botvinick likes to sort of say that birds were studied to understand flight. But the general idea, I think, is is true. And then it's had reincarnations that if you want to understand your MATLAB code, you <laughs> don't have to understand how the transistors in your computer speak to your MATLAB code. It's irrelevant, right? Unless your computer breaks. So that so Ma was basically sort of getting at this idea of levels of understanding, levels of realization. You know, is psychology a field that will never be subsumed by neuroscience? Um, are there effective theories at one level that don't require diving down below that level? So it's all this family of discussions about you know, then there's Phil Anderson's famous paper um, that uh, of um, more is different. Also, where he has a diagram that you've got psychology all the way down to physics, and that they're all independent disciplines, and they all have their own explanatory vocabularies. So it's all part of this general view that there is no privileged level of explanation. That each question will have its favorite explanatory objects. And that to believe that it will all reduce down to some privileged level, which will explain away the levels above, is the general reaction to the reductionist project. Mm -hmm. And he's the name that has become the label for that counter reaction to what people see as reductionism. Right. But the general principle, as you say, is that there are these different levels with which to uh, approach problems and understanding and, and that there are merits within each level. So, And people, and just to say, I do think people get confused because there, there are disciplines, right? There's psychology, there's neuroscience, there's physics. There's a hierarchical organization of a complex system, right? So this is the point that sort of Dana Ballard makes in his book, um, Brain Computation as Hierarchical Abstraction, which is every complex system, you know, echoing Newell, has a hierarchical structure. And one of the key features of hierarchical complex systems is that the levels above omit details from the level below. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got the disciplines, you have the hierarchical organization of complex systems where details are omitted as you go up the levels. That is a, a central feature of these systems, right? You do not have all the details about transistors in your software. And then there's Ma computational algorithmic and implementation and people get confused that's true at every level you can be marian at the level of dendrites right you can be marian at the level of the history and science of the action potential so sometimes people think that computational level one means psychology and computation and, and, and implementation level three is circuit neuroscience that's not what he meant at all no but that's but that's that's what you're that's how you're framing it in this particular paper, in terms of studying neuroscience in general, right? So right now, wh where we are is the, the bias, right, of where neuroscience is mainly focused right now is studying the brain at the neuron level and the neuronal circuit level, and that's the implementation level. Uh, that's the level one, level three of David Marr, let's say. And where we want to be is uh, understanding which is the higher levels, the, the computation. What are these uh, processes giving rise to? What are the computations needed for the function uh, of the behaving organism, be it humans or any other animal? 
and and that's at the behavioral level. So so yes, yeah, so it's very very important to get this clear because I, I that, because I know how they sort of mesh, but they are but they are different, right? In other words, sometimes you can have your cake and eat it for particular circumstances where you can get the implementational level and the sort of computational algorithmic understanding sort of simultaneously, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the example I like to give is sort of David Robinson's study of saccadic eye movements, right? right? Where you can basically see the sort of causal sequence of events through neurons. You can have a computational idea like the neural integrator, and then you can actually see the eye movements themselves, and you get this nice isomorphism between the implementational, algorithmic, and computational levels. They all click into place. Now, even there, some details are omitted, but there is a feeling that you're getting the full under, the full shebang, right? The point we're trying to make is that the objects of understanding will probably not be neuron A connected to neuron B connected to neuron C once you get to more cognitive-like phenomena, right? That, that's, so that's where behavior of, co you know, when it comes more complex, allows you to infer the ob explanatory objects that you're going to use, which are going to be more abstract than neurons connected to each other, and then you can begin to theorize computationally algorithmically. But understanding that you can be Marian even at the level of a circuit. I mean, going back half a century, people have thought about neural circuits this way. Central pattern generators, mm -hmm. you know, the Brown's half-center model is an abstraction, right? It's, it's, it's an abstraction of how a central pattern generator works sure. that doesn't have to think about all the details and the types of neurons and their properties and interneuron types. You just have the half-center model. So even at the level of circuits, you abstract away the details and can be David Marion, right? So I just want, I just don't want to make sure we don't collapse the Marion perspective right, right. and its usefulness as a tool to a hierarchy of disciplines and phenomena that look at first blush to be equivalent, but they're actually not. No, that's a, I appreciate you making that point. So let's just linger on saccadic eye movements for a minute, right? So you feel pretty comfortable that you almost said you understand, but instead of you said, you know, the whole shebang, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, just generating eye movements, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then as we go up the cognitive hierarchy, uh, that line blurs and then eventually disappears, right? So, you know, as soon as you start talking about where to move your eyes, like making a decision, what to attend to, when your arousal is up, your pupils dilate. That changes the amount of light coming in your eyes. And so so all there's all these higher cognitive processes. So it it begs the question, where is that line where we lose uh, the explanatory power at the level of neurons and neural circuitry? I know that you don't know the answer, but I have to think that you would imagine it's really low level. Well, I mean, you know, I... David Robinson um, himself thought that going into cortex was too hard, right? <laughs> um, I, I remember um, a dinner in Germany with Karl Deiseroth where he also thought that cortex was hard versus looking at sort of subcortical nuclei, right. the brain stem, things like that. So there's always been this feeling that mammalian cortex, in my view, the way I think about it, is you go from neurons as mechanism in other words and let me just be very clear about what i mean by that it's when you're talking about spatiotemporal structure in other words you're talking about the physical instantiation of the circuitry right it's where they're localized in time and space like a stretch reflex like a saccadic eye movement where you can literally say you know the hip bone is connected to the knee bone is connected to the ankle bone <laughs> okay right yeah and then what happens is when you get to sort of cortex, neurons become not that kind of mechanism. They become harbingers and evidence for functional ideas, mm. right? So neurons as evidence as confirmation of theories versus neurons as the spatiotemporal physical instantiation of something. 
And what my feeling is, is that when you start getting into cortex and cognition, neurons just become another kind of evidence. They become just like behavior is evidence, just like lesions are evidence. And I think people confuse neurons as another piece of evidence for functional ideas with neurons as being the actual physical instantiation of the behavior that you're interested in. And all we try to say in that paper, and I'm trying to say elsewhere, is that if you think you can have neurons still have that isomorphic click-like feeling that you get for saccadic eye movements when it comes to cognition, it's just not going to happen. But you're not completely closing the book on it, but that is your feeling. Is that, do I have you correct? Yes, I think, I think, I, I, I think that you'll, you'll talk about populations of neurons, you'll do dimensionality reduction on those populations of neurons and come up with objects that you talk about, um, but they will be abstract objects that have been created out of neurons. But it's those objects that you will create your theories with which you can then make yourself understand something. In other words, you know, understanding a phenomena means that you have to have a theory, fuzzy or mathematical, that is intelligible, that you can use to understand the explanation of the phenomenon. This is a position put forward by a philosopher, very nicely direct, D-E-R-E-G-T in, in Holland, where he talks about this. And the point I'm making is that the theory with which a phenomenon becomes the explanation of the phenomenon becomes understandable via the theory, the objects out of which you construct that theory are more abstract and macroscopic than neurons as you move towards cognition, which is exactly, by the way, what all the AI people say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? They, they say that what we want to borrow from cognitive neuroscience and psychology are sort of algorithmic and computational theories of cognition uh, Matt Boffinick basically said on your program that, you know, maybe one day neurons will matter if we worry about energetic efficiency. The entire project at DeepMind is operating at that level. Uh, so I think it's understood, ironically, by fields outside of current circuit neuroscience, better than circuit neuroscience itself understands it. Yeah, well, the circuitry is hard enough to understand. So, you know, you get a little bogged down and, and focused and narrowly, narrowly focused on what you're doing, I suppose. It's hard to keep the big picture in mind. And, and as I said before, just, you know, whether it's saccadic eye movements, you end up coming up with an abstraction even there. You know, you, you say neural integrator. When it comes to CPGs, you talk about half center models. When it comes to the stretch reflex, you talk about reciprocal inhibition. So even at the level of circuits, you end up coming up with an abstraction. You know, Eve Marder's work in the stromatogastric ganglion, you know, you end up talking about sort of a ratio required of inhibition and excitation that can be implemented in many ways. Right. So even there, you're doing abstraction. So it's interesting. Uh, I mean, you mentioned, uh, I guess it's Direct was his name. Uh, I'll have to look up the, his definition of understanding because there's a lot of different definitions of understanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one is we. What was it? Uh, Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman mm -hmm. on his chalkboard uh, when he died had written something to the effect of, "I don't understand what I can't build." So, uh, and that's a common theme in understanding. So, if we can't build it, we don't understand it. Uh, another theme is if if we can make a model of it that that predicts everything that it does, then then we understand it. So, but you're on board with with. Direct definition of understanding in this. Well, I mean, I mean and, and yes, and also I think Feynman, you know, famously said that you had to have some intuitive physical understanding of the system without having to go through the entire derivation again. I think he was inspired by Dirac saying something just like that. So you need to develop skill in intuition so that you can intuit the solutions to the problems without having to go through the whole logical formalism over and over and over again. Um, in physics, there was always this tension between, ah, oh, we're only going to be able to describe and predict what's happening. We're not going to be able to understand it. In other words, actually direct, have a beautiful chapter on the difference reception of Heisenberg's matrix mechanics view of quantum mechanics and Schrodinger's wave mechanics view. And basically people couldn't understand the matrix mechanics, even though they accepted 
that it could make predictions, but they preferred Schrodinger's wave mechanics because they could visualize it and think with it, and they could do more generalizable work with it. So I would say that you do want to have understanding, and there will be cases where you get prediction and you can build uh, like a circuit or a dynamic network full of neurons, but you don't understand what's going on. And the way you get understanding is you bunch some of that into a bigger object, which you can then think with, and you give it a name, right? You say, you, you say reward, yeah. right? You say value, you say motivation, right? You say error, right? You, you, those words, an error, is, is a useful object to think with when you're thinking about learning rules. You know, you don't go into the details of every single neuron that was required to compute that error that you can then use in a computational model. So I would say that, yes, you can do prediction and building and description, but if you want to do understanding and develop a theory with which you can do intuitive work with, you're going to have to have objects that get bigger as the system gets more complex. In some of your talks, you have, well, I guess you could say admitted to guilt in previously pursuing, you know, scientific questions from the lower level, from the mechanistic level. And I'm not sure how accurate that really is, but I'm curious how how you personally came to, I, I think this is a really valuable approach. Uh, I think it's going to benefit uh, so many people <laughs> who receive the message. And I'm I'm just curious how you personally came to this way uh, of, of thinking uh, and realizing that it is that more behavior that we need and to think about it in terms of the sort of computational level. But anyway, I think it was more that I, I understood because I was also a doctor that there are two flavors of neuroscience. There's fixing neuroscience and there's understanding neuroscience. And I'm very interested in fixing neuroscientists. You know, I, I've been involved in the development of mouse models of stroke and I'm very interested in trying to actually go in at the neural level and fix the brain. So it is the correct level for fixing things. Sure. Yeah. Right? And you can look at the history of neuroscience as being sort of the history of neuropsychology. Tim Shalas has beautifully sort of outlined this. You've got the sort of neuropsychological, lesion-based, human-based science. You've got the Sherringtonian tradition of looking at neurons and treating the brain as an organ to be studied just like a liver or a kidney. And then you've got the whole computer science revolution, neural networks, computer science, information theory, information processing. And those three traditions sort of march along in parallel, the biomedical view of the brain, the neuropsychological view of the brain, and the computer science view of the brain. Mm. And then you have to decide which one of those traditions is going to give you that feeling of understanding via theories of a phenomena, and which is the one that's going to help you fix Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and all those. And it just began to be apparent to me that the win for fixing would probably be to treat the brain like an organ to a large degree. And for understanding, it was actually going to end up being parceled up between neuropsychology that became cognitive neuroscience and the computer scientists. Right? Mm -hmm. and, that, and, 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 and that neuropsychology and computer science would be aided by two other areas that are very helpful, which is philosophy and by complexity science. Mm. And that in a way, the organ view of the brain and the fixing, you know, what's called the sort of neuromolecular view of the brain was going to be left out of the party to some degree. That's what I began to realize. Um, and that's okay. If you want to have a neuromolecular circuit view of the brain in order to do medicine, that's fantastic. But it's going to be the philosophers, the complexity scientists, the psychologists, and the computer scientists who are going to give us the explanatory objects, I think, to understand intelligence. Let's, let's talk about the role of things like philosophy and psychology and, and so on here. You know, a lot of my previous guests have also said that they consider themselves, and they're neuroscientists, but they consider themselves more psychologists because they're, they're coming at it from this higher top-down sort of level, right? They have to think mm -hmm. about what the mm -hmm. function is, what the computation is. Uh, so if, if psychologists have it right in terms of how to approach understanding the brain, 
um, that we need to study these higher cognitive functions at that level. Do we just need better psychologists? Is it more a need for, for better philosophy embedded in an evolutionary perspective for uh, how cognitive functions might improve fitness or, or what? I mean, are we lacking that theoretical drive? I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm all for pluralism in science, and I'm very, very wary of saying we need more of this and few of these. I, I think, <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, I, I do, I do think that people like Matt Botvinnik, you know, Josh Tenenbaum, Sam Gershman, who are coming more from a mixture of sort of normative theories plus experiment are at the current time providing insights of the kind that people at DeepMind are interested in. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it's going to be an alliance between the sort of mathematical psychologists and the computer scientists that, which, which, that will provide more in insight into intelligence. I do think that. And also, especially when you want to do human work, right? You can do a lot of psychophysics in humans at lower expense, and you can learn things without having to do uh, lots of invasion. Uh, cognitive neuroscience, where you sort of get neural confirmation, right? You, you know, the, the famous example of um, the connectionist accounts of the past tense, right? That how do you learn the past tense? You know, because there are ED for the regular verbs, and then there are just one case after another for the irregular verbs. And so there was, as you know, a famous debate about this. Could one connections network do the irregular or regular? Mm. And then people um, like Gary Marcus and Steven Pinker sort of showed that developmentally the kind of errors that get made are not consistent with a single neural network. Uh, then patients that showed, depending on how much you believed it, doubled associations between these abilities so this debate between how these things were done are very much at the level of neuropsychology plus lesions that help confirm or refute these ideas. So cognitive neuroscience, people like Tim Shallis, Dick Passingham, I think Russell Poldrack, making the case that you can use macroscopic brain data to inform psychological theories. And I think that's what cognitive neuroscience, but it's still, in my view, way above the level of neuron A connected to neuron B connected to neuron C. Um, so yes, but then there are people who will say that there are principles of cognition that might be present in an identifiable circuit. Like let's study the honeybee. Look at those amazing feats of navigation and communication that a honeybee does. Mm -hmm. Surely we can do Sherringtonian style neuroscience on a honeybee, call what it does cognition, and then by some scale invariant magic, extrapolate to higher types of cognition in mammals. Right. So I don't think much of that approach, to be honest. I think it's fascinating to learn how a honeybee waggles and navigates, but I'm not convinced that you're going to learn some circuit level primitive that is going to be extrapolatable to mammalian cortical <laughs> cognition. Uh, <laughs> and if it does, you'll end up with an abstraction that they've created there at the level of the circuit. So even there, it will be a pyrrhic victory because they'll end up with some abstraction that they carry up to the higher level rather than some connectivity uh, requirement. But when you're thinking, I, I'm not trying to push back too much, but when you're thinking, you know, at what level are we satisfied with a behavioral account, right? With an evolutionary account of adaptation, adaptive behavior that increases fitness. And so we want to study, let's say, honeybees, let's say. Um, the dancing uh, gets them, you know, communicates to their, uh, what is a honeybee group? A tribe? A <laughs> Uh, 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 a hive or hive, a swarm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it communicates to the swarm the direction, the distance of where the honey is. Um, and then we, we come up with an explanation uh, or a story uh, about how that's evolutionarily fit. And that's where the computational level approach comes from, right? And then we can make theories about what we might discover neuronally and look for confirmation. 
But that's an abstraction in itself to some degree. It's a story that we're telling ourselves. Mm -hmm. And how do we know we're telling ourselves the right story? We don't have to go too deeply into this. Uh, I just, that same question can apply at all levels, I think. Yes, but you're, you're absolutely right. But if you're, but then somebody will say, well, you only really understood it if you can say that you can actually simulate in your head the sequence of flow of information from neuron to neuron. And then you're going to need to have, but that's impossible. We can't do that in our head. We can't hold on to all these objects, especially when they start interacting in a many body way. You, you can, you can't intuit it. That's why differential equations and models help because they can actually reproduce behavior that you can't simulate in your head mm -hmm. right so you're always having to give over to some kind of abstraction and i could always say to that person actually you don't really understand it completely until you give it to me at the quantum mechanical level <laughs> right? you would and and, yeah. and and they just don't have an argument against that right they're going to have to explain why they feel that they have discovered the privileged level of, of understanding and they don't have an argument for it. What they have is that's the level at which they can intervene and manipulate. But that's different, right? That's the sort of what I call the medical causal manipulative view. Mm -hmm. of thing. But only in rare cases do they glob onto each other, right? Glom onto each other, right? Usually, I think they dissociate, right? That's what in physics are called effective theories, right? You can work with the rules of thermodynamics without always having to think in terms of statistical mechanics, even though one is entirely explained by the other in that particular case. So it's just a confusion between the kind of theories that you can do explanatory work with and what you need to do in order to fix something. And Newell made this case. You don't need to know how mm. your computer works when you program on it unless it breaks. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, so do you view so do you view the, the, the levels issue as one of uh, a gradient, right? So so you do have some cases like let's say eye movements where you feel uh pretty certain you feel like you understand it if you understand the neuronal circuitry underneath and it maps on well to the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go a step up. You know, mm -hmm. is that a gradient level? Is it an analog going up? Or are there really these distinct levels that at some point, like an electron, you have to jump to the next? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it could be. I think I think one has to be avoid making absolute statements. I think it is a kind of gradient where the amount of variance explained by a level goes down the lower you go, right? In other words, you, you, you're always the component parts with which you construct your theories to explain what's happening are level or two down, right? And then that does most of the work for you. And then you can drop below that. So you have level N, you have level M plus one and you have level N minus one. Level N minus one is good for level N and level N is good for level M plus one. Hmm. The amount of variance that explained by N minus one to explain level N plus one drops is my my guess would be I see. as you go down and down and down. So I think it is a continuum, um, and that's why people intuitively don't feel that they need to be particle physicists to be circuit neuroscientists, <laughs> right? And and chemists don't feel like they have to be particle physicists to be chemists. And this is the point that Phil Anderson made. So there is no privilege level. Each one has its own degrees of freedom and its own explanatory objects, and it's usually going to be one level down or two in my view. So uh, occasionally I do. A joke of the show. Uh, I just, I just invented one. Can I try it out on you? Yes, but okay. Don't. I can't promise I'll laugh. Oh no! I'm. They're not made for laughing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How how do you define a gentleman? I don't know. It's uh, your neuroscientist friend who can explain to you how his computer works, but doesn't. <laughs> it's not, that's actually not so bad. <laughs> right, well, right, right. So, some of my listeners will be happy with that. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, well, uh, and the only thing is, is maybe the women who are neuroscientists will not be so thrilled. It's okay because I, I understand that there's sexism in the joke, but I mean, I can't say gentle person, you know. <laughs> all right. Yeah. John, so you have all of these different tracts with what you're doing. What percentage among all these vocational terms do you consider for yourself? So you know, neuroscientist versus neurologist versus psychologist versus philosopher 
versus author, I dare say. Do you, can you break it down currently? Mm. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 feel, I feel slightly, I, neuroscientists, it's such a nascent field um, that I find the term slightly irritating, <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, um, oh. Because it, you know, it, it, it holds out a promise that it can't keep still, in my view, but that's just, it's a little bit like say, calling yourself an artist, you know, I, that's for other people to call you. Right. Okay. You, neurologist, I feel a little better about because, you know, it's a designated field of medical intervention. And, you know, I do look after stroke patients. I don't think that that's an opinion. I, 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 I know how to look after stroke patients. So neurologist. Philosopher, I think my philosopher friends would say you, you're not an right. official philosopher. So maybe... So yes, I, I suppose cognitive neuroscientist and neurologist would be okay, um, but really, I think I'm just a kind of critic. I was about to ask what what percentage irritated do, are you? <laughs> I, I, I I do fear for the intellectual health of universities in general and of disciplines. I, I you know maybe this is the chance to talk about why philosophy is so important. Yeah, I think you know. If you look at people like Thomas Kuhn uh, and then people who've been inspired by him, like this wonderful, I can't recommend him enough, philosopher and historian of science, Hassock Chang at Cambridge, who's written some beautiful books. And he basically has this idea that philosophy is a form of complementary science. He's quite bold. He actually says that philosophy can add to scientific knowledge by thinking about exactly those topics that specialization has banished, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just looking back over the past and being careful in the def defining of terms, but actually there are lots of things that have fallen by the wayside that specialties don't want to think about. Like, for example, the whole conversation we've been having and that paper in Neuron, I think in one way, the reason why it made the splash that it did is because it's not that common to have such papers in scientific journals. And I should say that there were some journals that were not too pleased at the idea of having a paper like that. Sure. Because it might alienate the neuroscientists. So philosophy is a form of complementary knowledge generation where it sort of gets between the gaps and the interstices of why do we know what we know? Why do we think we know what we know? Why did we do this and not that? Why did we all love the mouse and no longer study the cat, the dog, or the monkey? In other words, it's more a sort of critical style that is essential to the generation of scientific knowledge, not just a way of criticizing knowledge builders. You contribute yourself. So I think Hassel Chang um, is very, very right about that hmm. and then and interestingly enough speaking to my brother when i try talking about irritated he doesn't he gets annoyed at me when <laughs> i want him to define complexity uh -huh. one of the things that he says is what the santa fe institute does from the complexity side is to address all these thorny issues that the specialist sciences don't want to have to entertain hmm. so what is interesting is that when it comes to both thinking about what does it mean to understand the mind via the brain or how are we going to generate general AI, it's really interesting that a lot of the way of thinking about all this is going to come from, I think, complexity science, come from philosophy, come from psychology, come from the computer scientists. But you know what? It hasn't yet. There have been millennia. Uh, I mean, maybe not for complexity science, but philosophy, right? That's why I asked about how we approach these things in our own mind today versus a thousand years ago. I think philosophy is a secondary subject. I mm -hmm. think what philosophy does is it runs along in parallel like a super brainy tug tugboat, and it's there to optimize the quality of the knowledge and add to it that is being generated by the primary specialties. So in other words, you know, a Daniel Dennett has made, for example, has made an enormous effort to understand the neuroscience and he's attends neuroscience conferences all the time. Mm -hmm. 
So philosophers are kind of like the secondary specialists who can actually make sure that the primary knowledge generators do a good job. Is it is it fair to say that one of the philosopher's main job is to figure out what the right question is? Uh, yes, I think I, I think that is a. I mean, I, I think a lot of creativity in general is about formulating questions rather than giving answers. And I think that's what happens a lot when people have de- you know, they get their PhDs and they do all their exams and then they write their papers that their PIs want them to write. So it's all sort of generating answers to exams and to questions. And then when you have to come up with your own questions, suddenly they panic. Oh, my God, I, ha- I have no one to tell me what I should worry about. <laughs> so I think I think to some degree, the philosophical generation of creative questions is important. And, you know, 200 years ago, all scientists called themselves natural philosophers. Nowadays, especially in neuroscience, it's a, it, they, spit, they spit out the yeah, word. Yeah, nasty. Right? Yeah, uh, but it's completely wrong-headed. And you're philosophizing all the time, as Dan Dennett points out, just badly, if you don't admit it. And if you do it well, it can, as Hassock Chan says, greatly enhance the quality of what you do. Um, And, you know, Einstein and Bohr, they all talked overtly about the importance of of philosophy. Hmm. So it's a it's a it's a way of asking questions. It's a way of thinking critically. It's a way of defining terms logically. And it's also a way of addressing questions that just go unanswered because they're not part of the Kuhnian notion of normal science. In other words, Kuhn was not just about revolutions and paradigm shifts. He was about the theories of normal science. And one of the things that Kuhn said was that you have to exclude certain ideas and certain vocabularies and certain people for that specialty to proceed. I'll give you a great line, if you don't mind, from Kuhn. I I actually saved it for you because I was looking at it last night. Is this from his, is this from his, um, what is the book called? No, no, this is, this is actually from a Hassock Chang book. I see. So, Here's the first quote. Criticism is the lifeblood of all rational thought, Karl Popper. Uh, uh To turn Sir Karl's view on its head, it is precisely the abandonment of critical discourse that marks the transition to a science. (laughs) Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn, yeah. But just to to see the subversion of that statement, it is precisely the abandonment of critical discourse that marks the transition to a science. In other words, the point being made there is a deep one, is that you don't want critical, subversive thought within a specialist science. You want to all share an assumption, share a vocabulary, and you don't want someone to say, why are you doing optogenetics to study this animal circuit to understand this? Why do you think that's even going to answer the question? That's annoying, right? Because you want to get on with the conference. You want to get on with your grant writing. So the deep point that Kuhn is making there is that that kind of questioning is banished. And it's the philosophers who are the ones who are going to be allowed to ask those critical questions as they run alongside the production of the specialty. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and that is true. You try and question the enterprise at a scientific conference and that you'll be removed by security as a mad homeless person. <laughs> well, John, gosh, that's the first, you're the first guest to offer a quote. That's uh, that's so generous. Thank you for... Well, uh, well, it's just, it's such a great Thomas Kuhn quote because it detonates the more you think about it. Yeah. Right. That's great. Can we, let's talk just a, a little bit more about, unless you, unless we want to go on in philosophy, I was, I was going to kind of wrap up the behavior yeah, no, paper sure, approach. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, do you think that the proper study of behavior, if we go with a behavior first implementation here, uh, and the understanding that follows, do you think that that will, I think I know your answer here, but do you think that that will lead to understanding non-behavioral cognition, things like consciousness, latent thought patterns, et cetera, where there isn't per se a behavior to be, unless there is a behavior and I'm not recognizing it? Well, I mean, you know, Consciousness, I'm trying to avoid both in this conversation sure. and in the book. I mean, uh, I, I, I feel Christoph Koch gave a great talk in Dublin at the Schrodinger Festschrift 
uh, last September, and um, I had a chance to speak with him, and he, I much preferred the idea that consciousness is a feeling, that you should think about it more like pain mm-hmm. than the ultimate cognitive achievement. Yes, achievement. Oh, that's a great phrase. That's a great word. Right. Yeah. That, 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 that I think some people think consciousness is sort of the pinnacle, the axe, the, the pinnacle of cognition. And yes. I, and I and I don't think that's correct. Um, I think it's sort of more like pain. And, you know, I was at a meeting on animal cognition or something. I can't remember the exact name of the conference at NYU early last year. And there was a woman whose name I'm forgetting who was doing beautiful work trying to see whether fish feel pain. Yeah. Right. It, the beautiful, very clever experiments making the case that it's not just aversion to a stimulus, that it was actual pain, you know, somewhat similar to Joseph Ledoux's sort of recent concern that we're calling aversive responses fear right when we shouldn't be doing that so here's again but nevertheless i do think you can get some experimental traction on pain how far you can get to the subjective feeling of pain versus just the motor response to a noxious stimulus um is an open question it's not an area that i you know i'm involved with but i think efron's copy uh the notion of self and non-self pain going that route could be really useful i mean nick i was going to recommend a book uh, uh nicholas humphreys who who is a philosopher psycho- psychologist actually who a friend of dan dennett's wrote a wonderful little book called soul dust where he talks about how we might get towards the science of consciousness mm. so i i think that Philosophers and psychologists have very interesting things to say and animal experimentalists about these things. I do. Well, do you think that we have a hypothesis, you know, of coming from that sort of computational level um, of human-like intelligence uh, sufficient, you know, to, to entertain pursuing general AI or something like consciousness? Uh, we don't need to harp on consciousness. It's you know, just I think I, 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 you know, I don't work on 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 higher cognition, but yeah. I think you know, that wonderful paper by um, Josh Tenenbaum uh, Lake, I can't remember his first name, Brendan Lake, Sam, Brendan Lake, yep. that they wrote in BBS where they made suggestions as to what the component parts would need to be. Yeah, um, were really great to get towards general AI, hmm. um, intuitive sociality, intuitive physics. I think that, uh, yes, that they are coming up with a kind of um, normative view of the components that you would need for general intelligence. And they are offering it up to Matt Botvinnik and the crew at DeepMind. Um, and he's running with it, too. Yeah. Yes, I think they are. I think that they, I think there's some interesting psychological level normative level views that that are very very interesting you know then you've got you know the fristonian predictive coding way of thinking about the brain and um you know a super normative view of the brain right he's not particularly interested in how it might be instantiated although i think so yes but as you can see all of this is quite high level and abstract yeah 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 i'm gonna Hopefully in a few weeks, I'll, I'll, we'll be talking about Markov blankets and the free energy principle, and so that'll be fun. Right, and you, whoever you get who can actually explain it clearly. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, but it's but the but again, that's very different different from thinking that we're going to get it by studying a small circuit in Drosophila. Do you think, given given that you know, there's your preference, let's say, uh, to approach from the computational level. And the benefits thereof, does it even make sense to model AI after the brain? I mean, you know, so so you have these units that were originally inspired by neurons, uh, and then there's abstractions, and then every once in a while you come back and you add dendritic components to the units in your neural network, et cetera. But does that even make sense if we're really coming at it from the uh, functional computational perspective? Well, I mean, I think you have to say that given that the only object so far that has general AI, general intelligence, is the the brain in animals and humans, then not to look there would be pretty bloody-minded, right? Because as everyone is pointing out, you know, Gary Marcus points this out, 
Uh, Brendan Lake and the others pointed this out, that classification is not the same as building models of the world. Yeah. Surely, if you want to find out how to do it, you're going to have to look at the one place where it's successfully been implemented. So does that mean that you have to blue brain project like right. reconstruct the brain all the way up from its circuitry? No. I mean, and in fact, as I said, the deep mind people explicitly say they don't think you need to reconstruct the brain from the ground up. But of course they believe that psychology and even neuroscience may be providing the missing bits yeah. that are not present in the neural network abstraction that they're currently using, you know, because, you know, they, they, they basically have a universal kind of architecture. Admittedly, they're modularizing it more now, adding external memory, and they also have a couple of learning algorithms. But what happens if not only is the architecture far more modular than they think, but even the learning algorithms might be much more modular. If you read somebody like Randy Gallistel, right, he says, why do we believe that there's going to just be a few learning rules? What if yeah. each, each function that comes along both within an animal and across animals is associated with its own special learning mechanism? I mean, that's the kind of nightmare, I think, for AI, if it turns out that not only do you have modularity in architecture, but you've got modularity in the learning algorithm as well. And I think Jeff Hinton recently has stated that we're going to have to go back and dream up new learning algorithms. So yes, I think you, you go and look at the one place that solved the problem. Now the level at which you have, how deep down you need to go to get the answer is an open question. But you know, Nico Kriegerskorter um, very much believes that, that a neural network modeling approach is going to bridge sort of behavioral stuff like in our paper um, and neural circuit detail. I mean, he really thinks that you're going to go between cognitive neuroscience, psychology, behavior and neural circuitry. The bridge in between is sort of neural network modeling and AI. He, he sees it as the, if I'm understanding him correctly, and I've spoken to him as the kind of rescuer yeah. that is going to bridge why, why are you rolling your eyes right now, John? I'm no, not. I'm, I'm not. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> How, yeah. No, he'll kill me. No, I, <laughs> I, I, um, I sort of admire both the optimism and I think I admire the fact that he's articulated a way forward. In other yep. words, I, he, he actually has thought deeply about the existence of the problem and has thought of a way to bridge the seemingly unbridgeable areas of sort of behaviorally inspired task-based conceptions at the cognitive level and the neural implementational level. And he thinks that in a sense, neural network modeling will be the way to bridge between them. And I think he's articulated it almost better than anyone mm. that I've heard about that. I just don't know whether it's going to deliver the goods. That's all. Right. So I, let's, let's wrap up talking about the paper here with one final question and, and then and then I want to ask you some more general kinds of questions. So mm. what advice would you give to someone uh, that might be listening who's, you know, in a lab that is completely unfocused on <laughs> behavioral concerns, you know, say a grad student in their, in his or her third year um, or a postdoc or something? You know, what, what advice would you give them? Well, I, I thought I'd give them three bits of advice. One is when they go to SFN, <laughs> go on a random walk. Huh. through the posters <laughs> okay don't just go to don't just go on to your area sure um so have a day or two where you just random walk to have a pi that will allow you to go to the library and have a reading day in other words find a way to read books what's the one book that you would recommend if someone's going to go really specifically to give people like a foundation for thinking along the lines of of this neuron paper that we've been talking about i would say i would say the book which i think is really thoughtful um besides yours which will will no, be no, the one that well, comes out uh, the, the book this book is more uh, i hope short book to cover this for the intelligent general public right in other words because I, I i actually feel that there are lots and lots of books coming out about the brain all the time but a book that sort of tries to talk about these issues that we're discussing i can't actually think of one right you either so that's why we're doing it um but the book i think that 
The first chapters are really thoughtful. Um, is the book by um, Chalice and Cooper mm, okay. called The Organization of Mind. It's, a, it's more of a textbook. Uh, but Tim Chalice, I always think, has been very, very thoughtful, is very thoughtful. But that book by Chalice and Cooper, The Organization of Mind, I think is really interesting historically, scientifically. And it's really a cognitive, it's, it's basically making a claim for cognitive neuroscience. Great. Okay. There's going to be a, lo a long show notes uh, for this episode. <laughs> this is great. So and, then, and just one other book that I would say, if you want to, this is not about neuroscience, but if you want to sort of see where philosophy and history of science come together in an incredible way, it's a dense book, but it's called uh, Inventing Temperature by Hassop Chang, the philosopher I was talking about before. Okay. Great. And it's just an amazing book to show you what can happen when you make a case uh, for the history and philosophy of science informing how we think about a scientific phenomenon. Great. So your second piece of advice, I'm sorry I interrupted you, was to uh, have a, a day or two to go to the library. Yeah. And then, and then I think third is to seek out those people in the field that you think are the thinkers, in other words, get them to have a conversation with you, you know, see why, what they think. In other words, visit another lab, go to another lab's meetings, go to some other talks on your campus, you know, go to a history and philosophy of science talk. If you're a molecular neuroscientist, go to a systems neuroscience talk. In other words, Try and inject some intellectual variety into your academic experience because it's so easy just to be spend hours and hours and hours deep into the night in your own lab trying to collect data and you just don't have a broad intellectual experience as a consequence. So you don't recommend standing up in lab meeting and brandishing your fist in the air and quitting? <laughs> no, I, I, but I, but I, I think there's a hunger amongst the young. Um, and then I would also say what I've noticed is that there's some really thoughtful things going on um, in the blogs and on Twitter. In other words, really thoughtful people mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, like uh, Mark Humphreys, right? Mark, yep. is that right? Yep. You know, I think, you know, very thoughtful sort of blog and pieces and i think um to be part of an intelligent twitter community <laughs> and to see the and 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 see the piece i mean i actually I, i'm on twitter and i have to say um some very interesting feeds threads some very interesting pieces that i wouldn't have known about if you follow the right people yeah you could really really be part of a debate uh that i wasn't possible before what, so do you have, um, I know that the lab has a Twitter feed at Blam Lab. But yeah, you that's your, the one that, no, that's the one I use. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I've, I've thought about whether it was a good or a bad thing that I'm sort of hiding under Blam or not. But at this point, I don't really feel like switching over. <laughs> no, I hear you. Someone told me I needed to get a, a Twitter feed specifically for the podcast. And I thought, God, no. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, so, so yeah, so SFN, reading, meeting diverse people on your campus and then getting to be part of some in, some thoughtful tweets and blogs it, it, it can be very informative so my, my final thought um, just to wrap up this paper is that um, of course science is frustrating and that's part of the beauty of it um, but so this paper and and the reaction that it has garnered it's an example to me of this strained beauty of of how science slowly progresses right and it corrects itself as it lumbers on and and this is almost a corrective energy that's been injected uh do you yes i mean it's, it's it's actually fascinating you know i never and i mean this sincerely i you know you you write these things more i don't know you hope that somebody will read it but you don't <laughs> you don't think it's going to be prescriptive but i have to say it, it it's amazing to me how this paper and its exhortations have sort of trickled into the vernacular i mean there have been counter papers about behavior you know and churchland had a very good paper saying how you have to sort of mix pragmatism with the ideal sure um, 
there have been conferences that have been held with behavior prominent in the title. So I feel in a way that that it has actually there, there's pushed a, new- me a little bit. Yes. I, I, I mean, it, it gets cited a lot. There's the right? new journal, so, the behavioral, the journal of behavioral, I forget the name. Uh, well, nature, human behavior, right? Yes. I, I, I feel like there, there has been an awareness. You know, there was just an editorial just this week or last week from the, in the journal of neuroscience about how to write behavioral papers. And this was a journal that there was a big... <laughs> you write them and you send them somewhere besides to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there was a big, I don't know if you know this, but there was a big fracas about whether the Journal of Neuroscience was going to stop accepting purely behavioral papers. Mm. And then um, Reza Shadmia and David Hertzfeld did an analysis, which is available on BioArchive, of the citation rates for purely behavioral papers in the journal of neuroscience and actually showing that they were the cited the most <laughs> right now that shouldn't be the metric that you use right, right. but it was but it's but it, i find it really interesting that, that that there's been this almost vault fast and now you've got the journal of neuroscience with an issue an editorial on the ideal form of a behavioral paper mm-hmm. i don't think that it's a coincidence that that came out after that paper and the influence it's had. So mm. yes, I, I, I'm more optimistic and more heartened than I ever expected to be about the reception of this paper. And what will inevitably happen, which is what always happens, is that people will, it will dissolve into being, well, that's just obvious, we all knew it, and its origins will be lost in time. Mm. But you know, that's the price you just pay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, well... Thank you for di- diving deep into uh, these issues and, and from the paper. And uh, it's time for some freeze, fight, or flight, if you have a few more minutes. Okay. Okay, so, John, what is a talent that you have that uh, not many people know about? I know you have a lot of talents that a lot of people do know about. I don't really have any talents. I, what I do have, I mean, I do have anti-talents. In other words, I... I can't open a wine bottle. I can't parallel park. I don't know my left and right. Yeah. I, I, I can't cook. I'm actually a kind of bundle of failures that have led me to actually do this one thing. <laughs> I, I, you know, the only thing I can think of is I've always been kind of good at racket sports. So, you know, at some time in my life, I paid for my school at badminton, table tennis, tennis, squash. I always was on the teams for racket sports. All right. So I was kind. So now that even though I'm a complete klutz in everyday life, it seems like I do have some <laughs> eye hand coordination of another form that simply fails to generalize. And then, you know, I suppose early on in life, I did do a lot of drawing. I liked, do, I, I thought one day I might be a cartoonist. I haven't really turned my hand towards mm. that. So I like that. But otherwise, I, there's nothing that, I would be the first to die on a desert island. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's, you really are kind of a failure. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I was recently reading uh, James Baldwin's book, uh, No Name on the Street. This is mm-hmm. um, published in 1972, and it's about his account being a black man uh, traveling multiple parts of the world, but uh, also in the United States. Uh, and the book ends... Uh, on this quote. I have a quote for you, and the book ends on this quote. I recommended this book to you, didn't I? You may have recommended this book to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What, how does it end? It is terrible to watch people cling to their captivity and insist on their own destruction. I think black people have always thought this about America and Americans, and have always seen, spinning above the thoughtless American head, the shape of the wrath to come. Mm. Wonderful. Is bias something that you worry about with AI systems? Well, you know, it's interesting that I would love to think that that there's nothing inevitable about intelligence having biases. Um, and And sometimes I think, wouldn't it be wonderful to sort of start again and have intelligent systems without this utterly unintelligent stance that some people are better than others? I mean, it just doesn't follow. It, it sort of 
antithetical to the notion of intelligence that people would think this way. And, you know, we've just had this deeply embarrassing yet again revelation from Watson of his racism. Um, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know there was Yeah, that. there was a documentary and again oh. he comes out saying Gosh. this. Um, and it's so, you know, it's so funny because I, you know, we just went to see um, If Beale Street Could Talk, which was a novel by Baldwin that has been made into a film by the wonderful director Barry Jenkins who who made Moonlight. And you watch these fantastic people just be indifferently crushed under the white wheel. It's just baffling. I mean, if you are an empirical person, you just don't understand why is this. And and what I, you know, just to say, I think I, I'll just say, I feel like when you have an intelligent system, it's capable of developing cognitive disorders. Mm. So wherever you have cognition, you have cognitive disorders. Psychiatry is the medical field to deal with the cognitive disorders that are thrown up by intelligent systems. This is something that Mark Humphreys echoes as well on his in the Spike work. So, so you know, interestingly, it would maybe if you could have a psychiatry of AI systems, you might get some insight into how inevitable is it mm. that you're going to have profound, very hard to cure cognitive disorders like racism. Maybe that's something to hold out for. Could we have a bigotry-free intelligent system? But I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but just yet another failure on your part here. So. Yes. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. just a few more questions here. So uh, what will come first? Understanding our own cognition and intelligence or an AI that replicates it? Mm, I, I, I mean, I, predicting the future is a terrible thing. I, I think that if things were to continue at their current pace, and I were willing to, to believe in the optimism of the Matt Bot the next of this world, and that 2012 wasn't just a peak before another AI winter, mm. um, I'd like to think that doing really good cognitive neuroscience and psychology plus what's happening at places like DeepMind. In other words, that the prescriptions put forward by Lake and co in that article were taken up, that that's the way it's going to go. I don't think it's going to come from animal model neuroscience that scales up. What's one example when luck has played a particularly large role in, in something that has shaped your scientific trajectory? Mm. It's freeze, fight, or flight, so you can always skip. It's, it, 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 it's all luck. I, I would say... In the two fields that I'm involved in, right, sort of computational experimental motor control and motor learning and in sort of neural recovery, uh, both of those were based on entirely serendipitous events. One was that I met at a meeting. In fact, it was pure luck. It was at a meeting being given uh, uh, Richard Frakowiak, who used to be the head of the functional imaging lab in London, was giving a talk on PET studies of motor recovery after stroke. I was asked as a neurology resident to escort him around Columbia University. Mm. I went to his talk. I asked a question at the end of his talk about motor recovery after stroke, finding it interesting. There was a professor of motor control called Claude Gez, who wrote the chapters in the original Kandel and Schwartz. And he came up to me and said, you asked a very interesting question about recovery of motor control after stroke. But in order to really get at your question, you need to understand motor control. So you should join my lab and study motor control. So in other words, in one afternoon, both the scientific side and the clinical side happened and I have no idea what would have happened if I hadn't attended that lecture on stroke recovery with Claude Gez present in the audience to hear my question. So it was pure luck. I mean, if you consider it good that that happened. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, but otherwise, I honestly do wonder whether that afternoon hadn't happened. I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Yeah, that's so interesting. That's a, that's a good one. What, yeah. what is uh, one idea that you can't do or, or don't have time to do or the resources or something that, that you would hope that someone else might pursue? Well, that's a very pertinent question right now. Uh, for There are two areas that I 
I certainly don't think I'm going to get in, in, involved in. I think one would be a really rigorous program to study expertise. In other words, what's the difference between being skilled and being expert? Yeah, this is a subject I wanted to talk about today, but yeah. that's something very, I mean, I'm very interested in skill yep. and what it means and how it morphs into expertise. I think Adrian Haith, who's the co-director of BLAM, who was a postdoc with me before, I think he's so bright and so talented. I think he's going to start moving in the direction of skill and expertise. Well, you guys have written about automaticity and the yeah. effects of practice yes. and such. Yes, yeah. so we're very interested in that area. And I think really, to be honest, he's the one who's going to make all the relevant discoveries mm -hmm. down the line. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one, I think, is we very, very much need a monkey model of descending pathways and after injury. In ah. other words, a stroke monkey model. I, I think we're going to need in stroke recovery the equivalent of what happened when Malin DeLong came up with DBS for movement disorders and mm -hmm. Parkinson's disease. I think we're going to need a physiological intervention to repair. For, to repair, and I think that's going to require a very... Now, I'm lucky that I'm good friends with Stuart Baker, who's a superb monkey physiologist in England, who is now beginning to take on that challenge, and I'm going to play some role from the sidelines. But I would say expertise and what it is, and a physiological model of hemiparesis that allows a, an intervention are the two things that I think I will play a secondary role in, but I don't have the time to devote my time to. Yeah. Very good. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being I have no idea where this is all headed, and 10 being I feel pretty certain I know where this is all headed, uh, how would you rate your own internal model uh, for what AI will look like about maybe 20 years from now uh, and what neuroscience will look like uh, about 20 years from now? Um, so if I'm, I'm just going to take what my instinctive feeling is, yeah. right, which is I feel like we're probably not going to have flexible general AI in 20 years. I, I don't think so. I, I I'd like to be wrong, actually, but I, if I'm honest, I feel like it's we don't really know what it is. We don't know what we're yep. going to need. So I, I don't think 20 years is – and 20 years isn't as long as people think. It's really not. Yeah. As I get older, I realize that more and more. So I – so, I mean, just, you know, when oncogenes were sort of discovered in the 80s, people thought, aha, yeah. we're going to cure cancer, <laughs> right? And, and here we are 40 years later and we have yeah. it. Yeah. Um, neuroscience, I feel like we're going to do really interesting biomedical neuroscience. I am actually going to hold out hope that there are going to be better cures at the neuromolecular level. I, I'd like to believe that someone's going to come up with something for ALS, something for Alzheimer's disease. Hmm. I do. So that kind of neuroscience. When you say neuroscience, I, I'm talking about implementational level. I neuroscience. know that's what you. That's what that's yeah. the way you think of neuroscience, right? Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. I think I think that will be will be successful. I don't believe that circuit implementational level neuroscience is going to give us the answer to the first question you asked. Hmm. Well, John, thank you so much. I mean, this is, uh, you've been really generous with your time and um, that's a long time for me to continue to irritate you. So this is... <laughs> yeah. You haven't irritated me at all. I, let me just say that I think that your program is exceptional and I think you're doing an amazing thing here intellectually and to bring, and you know, you just told me you brought Tim Barron's on. I mean, Tim, you know, he and I are friends and uh, I think he's wonderful. He's great. And, uh, yeah. and he actually, I should say, he is the kind of person who could, in fact, bring together sort of an implementational version of more computational and algorithmic. But if anyone, the flavor of person who will actually manage to maybe bridge this along with someone like Nico uh, is Tim, someone yeah. like Tim. And he's got that factor X and the ambition to do it. His, um, actually... Right when I began speaking with you, I think the uh, my interview with him was posted, so people will have uh, heard it, obviously, by the time. Tim can also uh, touch his tongue to his nose. 
I could do that. Let me see. Oh my gosh, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> so yes, I'm so I can do that. That's, so that Tim, was, that was his special <laughs> talent. Oh, okay. Well, I can do that too. <laughs> I guess you like, can. How how weird. <laughs> yeah, that's strange. So, so John, so people can learn more about you um, through your website, which I'll link to um, uh, online, the the Blam Lab, and people can follow you on Twitter uh, at Blam Lab. And uh, thank you so much again for your time. No, my pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, just let me know when it posts so I can hide. <laughs> <laughs> Brain Inspired is a production of me. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling two or four dollars per month. Go to patreon.com slash braininspired or go to the website braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help keep this show going without any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stare.